knows a lot about the science stuff, Professor Dave explains. We just finished discussing the antibiotics revolution, which allowed physicians to successfully treat many of the infections that had killed billions of people over the millennia. Bacterial infections, once the number one world killer, have now more or less disappeared from the top 10 list of killer diseases, at least in the developed world. In this top 10 list, we now find conditions such as heart disease, stroke, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, cancer, and so forth. As we discussed in the introduction to this series, the average human lifespan increased dramatically in the 20th century, specifically due to our newfound ability to combat pathogens with antibiotics and a booming immunization program. But with infectious diseases sharply reduced in severity, these other conditions now present themselves as more difficult to tackle because they are not due to an invading pathogen, but rather to the intrinsic limitations of human biology and the aging process. For the rest of the series, we will focus mainly on the ways that mankind has been approaching the treatment of these conditions, and we will start with diabetes mellitus. Although diabetes was described in ancient times, it was probably not a very common condition. There was no effective treatment against it until the 20th century, so a diabetes diagnosis was a death sentence. Today, diabetes affects about 300 million people worldwide and seems to be, at least in part, the product of an unhealthy lifestyle. Luckily, many effective treatments are available, and most patients are able to live a normal life with a drug-based management protocol. The story of diabetes begins in ancient Egypt, with the first documentation of the condition and the first attempts at a cure. Earlier we mentioned German Egyptologist Georg Ebers, who acquired the famous papyrus that bears his name in 1872. The Ebers papyrus is one of the most important early documents of the ancient practice of medicine. Written around 1550 BCE, it was probably copied from much older documents. The Ebers papyrus describes diabetes as a condition in which patients eliminate plentiful urine, a hallmark of diabetes we now call polyuria. The following mixture was prescribed as treatment. A measuring glass filled with water from the bird pond, elderberry, fibers of the usset plant, fresh milk, beer swill, flour of the cucumber, and green dates. There are no modern studies to confirm or refute this treatment, perhaps in part due to the difficulty of collecting these unusual ingredients. However, it is reasonable to speculate that this bizarre concoction did not do much to address the underlying causes of diabetes. The Egyptian tradition had a strong influence on ancient Greek medicine. Although Hippocrates, the father of medicine, did not use the word diabetes, there are references in his work to excessive urinary flow with wasting of the body. Hippocrates must be credited with the concept of preventive medicine. He stressed the influence of diet and exercise on good health, and this is still one of the most important tools in preventing metabolic diseases like diabetes. In the Roman Empire, Galen and Areteus introduced the term diabetes from the Greek word for siphon. They described the rare disease as a melting down of the flesh and limbs into urine, and noted that the urine tasted sweet. There were actually urine tasters in those days, specializing in diagnosing the condition and its severity. The Hindus had noted this phenomenon much earlier than the Greeks and had named the condition honey urine. Upon noticing the attraction of ants to the urine of diabetic patients, they used ant attraction to urine as a qualitative test for diabetes. No progress was made regarding the cause of the disease during the Middle Ages. Maimonides, in the 12th century, proposed that diabetes was caused by the sweet waters of the Nile and the resulting heat that spread over the kidneys. We have already discussed Paracelsus and the Renaissance period as one in which speculative medical knowledge was rejected, and a movement was born to introduce experiment-based medicine. Thomas Willis, an English physician, was the first to propose, in the 17th century, that diabetes originated in the blood and not the kidneys, as diabetes patients had elevated glucose levels in the blood as well. However, the conclusive experimental phase did not begin until the 19th century. At the close of the 19th century, German physiologist Oskar Minkowski demonstrated conclusively that removal of the pancreas from a dog resulted in the sudden onset of diabetes, followed rapidly by death. 
In 1869, 22-year-old German biologist Paul Langerhans discovered the site in the pancreas which was responsible for glucose control, and his work was presented as his doctoral dissertation at the University of Berlin. In his honor, this key region of the pancreas is now named Islets of Langerhans. So at the turn of the 20th century, it became clear that a mysterious substance, probably a hormone, was secreted by a known region of the pancreas, and that the hormone, which we named insulin after the islets where it was produced, was responsible for controlling glucose levels in the blood. We now know that type 1 diabetes is caused by the inability of the pancreas to produce insulin, and type 2 diabetes is caused by the resistance of an organism to insulin action. Unfortunately, all attempts to extract insulin from pancreas cells only led to the hydrolysis of insulin by the enzymes in the pancreas. The hormone was apparently a peptide, and it took a few decades before a group of Canadian scientists working at the University of Toronto succeeded in the long-sought isolation. In 1921, young Canadian medical researcher Frederick Banting, working in the laboratory of Professor J.J. McLeod, decided to extract the pancreas from dogs, but he added a procedure called pancreatic duct ligation, which effectively destroys the cells responsible for secreting trypsin, the enzyme responsible for degrading insulin. Without the trypsin secreting cells, insulin remained stable and could be isolated. Injecting this hormone into sick animals and then diabetes patients had dramatic effects. Insulin's ability to restore health was so dramatic that its effects were described in colorful terms, such as the raising of the dead. Two years later, in 1923, Banting and McLeod were awarded the Nobel Prize for Medicine, a year after Banting had received his MD degree. Banting was also knighted by King George V in 1934 and received an annuity from the Canadian government to continue his research. Insulin was generally extracted from the pancreas of animals such as pigs and cows in order to treat patients. The hormone was administered by injection because it was not stable enough for oral administration. In 1926, insulin was crystallized and this allowed the preparation of a much purer product. It was another 30 years before the amino acid sequence was determined. In 1951, British biochemist Frederick Sanger unveiled the structure of insulin, for which he was awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1958. He was one of only two chemists to receive the Nobel Prize twice, the second time for his contributions to nucleic acid chemistry. The human insulin protein is composed of 51 amino acids. It is a heterodimer composed of two chains, an A chain and a B chain, which are linked by two disulfide bridges. A third disulfide bridge is located within the A chain. Upon isolation of insulin from animals, it became clear that the sequence varies slightly between species. Insulin from pigs is especially close to the human version, as it differs only by replacement of the C-terminal amino acid of the B chain, which is threonine in humans and alanine in pigs. Insulin from cows differs by three amino acid substitutions. Their biological activity in humans is very similar, but not identical. In the 1960s, insulin was also prepared by total synthesis, and its three-dimensional structure was elucidated via X-ray crystallography by Dorothy Hodgkin. With the advent of recombinant DNA technology, pharmaceutical companies introduced human insulin produced by bacterial fermentation of genetically engineered E. coli, which is still the most practical and cost-effective way of producing insulin. Large-scale production of insulin to treat diabetic patients is now heralded as one of the greatest scientific accomplishments of the 20th century, which suddenly enabled many patients to live a relatively normal life. We should not forget, however, that in the 1980s there was a violent backlash by anti-science groups against recombinant DNA technology and the production of human proteins by bacterial fermentation. Oddly, the anti-science lobby seemed to prefer seeing cows and pigs slaughtered and chopped up rather than to allow the unnatural insertion of a foreign human gene into a bacterium, which is now a routine practice. The same political forces and activists aligned against GMOs today were already at work back then. One of the main actors was Senator Ted Kennedy. In 1975, he called for hearings to tightly regulate recombinant DNA research, and he proposed that any federally funded scientist who did not obey his regulations should lose their NIH grant. This so-called high-risk research was actually banned at Harvard and MIT until the scientists installed a number of strict security measures. 
In 1982, Eli Lilly and Co. submitted a new drug application for recombinant human insulin, or Humulin, using a GMO. It was immediately approved. Human insulin is now readily available, despite the anti-science backlash. In spite of its successful applications, insulin is not a panacea against diabetes. People with diabetes are at increased risk for the long-term development of complications like blindness, kidney failure, heart disease, and stroke. The severity of these conditions is tightly related to the duration of episodes of uncontrolled high blood glucose levels. However, when diabetes is treated with newer formulations of insulin designed for controlled delivery or with the use of modern devices, which sense the level of glucose and meter the exact amount of insulin to keep glycemia within a narrow range, the side effects of high blood glucose can be successfully mitigated. Chemists have also been hard at work to improve the properties of insulin by modifying its structure. One example is insulin glargine, developed by the company Sanofi Aventis and marketed under the trade name Lantus. Insulin glargine differs from human insulin by the presence of a glycine residue instead of asparagine at position 21 of the A chain, and by extension of the carboxy terminus by two additional arginine residues. This does not alter the biological properties of insulin, but shifts the isoelectric point from a pH of 5.4 to 6.7, imparting more desirable solubility properties to the molecule. This allows for the subcutaneous injection of a clear solution with a desirably slow absorption from the site of injection without peaks and troughs for about 24 hours, resulting in a superior product. Today, there are many other options for the management of diabetes, and some of these will be discussed over in the pharmacology series. But thanks to this progress, diabetes is often considered a minor ailment, treatable to the point that many patients do not approach their condition with the attention it requires and suffer the often dreadful consequences. It is quite easy to forget that until 100 years ago, a diabetes diagnosis was a death sentence. This situation persisted till Banting's and McLeod's isolation of insulin, an event of extraordinary importance in the history of medicine and science in general. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to my channel for more tutorials. Support me on Patreon so I can keep making content. And as always, feel free to email me, ProfessorDaveExplains at gmail.com.